Okay, so hello and welcome to the Wolfram Emerging Leaders Program Science and Communications Show, the COVID-19 Hackathon Edition. Uh, I'm Anvesha Das and I'm currently a high school senior from India, Kanpur. I participated in the Wolfram Summer Camp 2019 and I'm a part of well. So we decided to come together and do a couple of hackathons. Uh, we ended up participating in three of them. So the first was Hack the Helix by Helix Foundation, and its theme was sustainability. We developed our project Green Up as a part of this hackathon, and we were placed overall third for this one. Um, we also did Hack Now, which was organized by CalHex. This was around two weeks after the first hackathon, and this one had a COVID theme. So we developed a project called Covtail, uh, which won the special award for waste flow. And the most recent one that we did was HTSS hacks, which had a pretty much like open theme, but we decided to go ahead and do a COVID related project. So we developed track off um, and we won the special award for domain.com, which was great. So do you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Maybe we could start with Claire. Uh, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Claire. I am a high school senior from Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, and I'm really interested in connecting fields of science. Hello, my name is Jessica. I'm from Williamsburg, Virginia, and I am a senior in high school and I'm from Williamsburg, Virginia, and I um, was part of Wolfram Summer Camp last year, as well as the Wolfram Emerging Leaders Program. And now I am a Wolfram Student Ambassador and I'm planning to study computer science at Columbia next year. Hi hey everyone, I'm Aranyo Ray, a high school senior from Kolkata, India. I love science and research. I went to the Intel ISF 2019, and that's where I first like got access to Wolfram Mathematica. And now I found this amazing team, and we decided to do these amazing hackathons together. And it was a really great learning experience. Okay, so cool. If you guys don't mind, uh, we'll probably go ahead and do a short Q&A, which is actually pretty general, uh, but might be fun to do. So Jessica, you have been coding in Wolfram language for some time now. Could you probably tell how you were first introduced to Wolfram language? Yeah, so um, I was first introduced to Wolfram by participating in the Wolfram summer camp last year. And um, my project at the summer camp was implementing a uh, DNA sequence alignment visualizer, which was really, really cool. And I got to combine my interests in bio biology as well as computation and um, I've been using Wolfram ever since a lot <laughs> and it's proven to be really useful from science fairs to hackathons and there's just so many cool things you can do with it. Absolutely. So now Claire, you started coding in Wolfram language pretty recently actually, if I'm not wrong, just with the start of the hackathon season. So what has been your favorite experience since then? Um, so yeah, so my first time coding in Wolfram was our first hackathon for Green Up. Uh, and I've really enjoyed the learning experience. That's probably been my favorite thing. Um, I like the fact that Wolfram makes it really easy to just like go on the internet and search up any command that you want and it tells you all about it, uh, which is super useful because I am definitely still learning. Um, and yeah, I really love also how easy Wolfram makes it to like manipulate data sets so you can like take in data and they have all these data sets for you to use. Um, so I really enjoyed my Wolfram learning experience and it's definitely something that I'll use in the future. That's great to hear. Um, so Aranyo, you were actually the one who kind of initiated the formation for our team. So maybe could you talk a bit about how exactly this team came about to be? and uh, uh, how has been your general hackathon experience? So uh, I met Anvesha at the Iris National Fair in India, which is the ICEF qualifier fair. And that's how we began talking. She began talking about her experiences at the Wolfram High School summer camp. And on the other hand, I joined this organization called uh, the Helix Initiative. And I found that they were starting a high school 
uh, friendly hackathon, which was called Hack the Helix. So I just texted Anvesha one day out of the blue, do you want to do this hackathon since now we are stuck indoors? So maybe we could make use of this time. And that's when she suggested that she could get her friends from the Wolfram camp and get all of the Wolfram enthusiasts on board. And that's how this team was formed. And I think from then on, after we did Green Up for the first hackathon, we kind of found the next hackathon while you know, looking through Dev Post or other sources. And that's how the team kind of get, uh, like got closer. And we decided to do the three hackathons ultimately. And all of them were unique in their own experiences. I'm uh, really excited you know, to talk and to hear uh, from my teammates about their experiences as well at these uh, amazing competitions. Yeah, so that's the story. Uh, my favorite part about being in a hackathon has been able to, I think, reach out to you guys and just be in touch with you guys in these hard times. That has been really nice. And uh, definitely creating those products. So maybe each of you could go ahead and talk like a line or two about what has been your favorite experience with hackathons. So um, my favorite thing about a hackathon is being able to go from like the ideation phase all the way to like a tangible product in such a short period of time. Like it's just really incredible like what the things we can, what things we can accomplish in such a short period of time. And I'm really glad that due to COVID-19, all these hackathons have been made available virtually, which makes them a lot more access accessible than having to like go to an in-person hackathon. And it's just really exciting to have that opportunity to participate in free virtual hackathons. Claire, maybe you could go next. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Jessica. I think hackathons, my favorite thing is like how much they've taught me about what people can achieve because so often we tell ourselves like, oh, you know, making something that tracks COVID-19 cases is not a project that we can do in 24 hours. And then, you know, you get a hackathon and you just make it happen. So I think it's, it's taught me a lot about how sometimes we underestimate ourselves uh, and that we should never say that we can't accomplish something because we definitely can. I definitely Anya? agree with what Jessica and Claire rightly pointed out. Um, I think personally for me, uh, connecting with passionate uh, people around the world and in my community as well uh, through hackathons and making something that's actually useful and something that's based off of you know, research and a lot of hard work in a limited period of time, that's what makes hackathons exciting for me, the people and the experience altogether. Great. So... We'll just move on to the last question here. Um, so I've been coding in the Wolfram language for a little over a year now. And with each project that I do, like the belief that Wolfram language is great is just reinforced. Um, my view of the Wolfram language with this power hasn't changed much. I think it's a like one of the most powerful languages out there, especially because it's a computational language. Um, so all of us have different like time ranges of using Wolfram language. So maybe uh, each of you could go ahead and talk a bit about has your perception of the language and what are its capabilities changed by doing the hackathons? So maybe we could start with Jessica, who's also been using it for a long time now. Yeah, so during these hackathons, what I really discovered is how much you can do with the Wolfram language in very short lines of code. Like you'll see all the other people talking about like how they already have like 90,000 lines of code where we can fit everything into a notebook that can come out to like a PDF of like three or four pages. Like that's just really incredible where we can have like a fully functional web app and just like, I would say like 200 lines of code, which is just crazy. Arna, maybe you could go next. Yeah, so like I said, my first you know, experience with uh, the Wolfram uh, language was when I got um, the Wolfram Mathematica Award, which is what every ISA finalist gets. So at that point of time, I like really play around with the language, you know, go through the Wolfram website, and I was really amazed at the things that the people at Wolfram and Wolfram enthusiasts in general were doing. But uh, I wasn't really sure if I could do it myself. Uh, but uh, like at this point, it's pretty clear, like having um, you three guys in, my, in the team and watching what phenomenal job you guys have been doing, uh, 
even I like I think uh, I can do you know uh, uh, harness the power of the Wolfram language and create cool projects in the future as well. That's just you know being uh, not just a learning experience but also something um, that I've learned from working in a hackathon and using the Wolfram language and seeing you guys uh, do these amazing like co uh, codes in the Wolfram language. So, I mean, my entire perception of the Wolfram language has been built on hackathons. So I don't really know if I can say that it changed, but I mean, I definitely discovered that like, it's an awesome language. I mean, I, I like using it and I love all of its data sets. Um, so that's pretty much my current perception of it, which hasn't really changed. Well, we hope it develops in the future and they're all positive things about it, uh, which I'm sure they'll be. Uh, so <laughs> with that, I think we could start with our project demonstrations. So maybe Arne could get a head start on the introduction for track off. Yeah. So we made track off for our last hackathon, which was uh, HDHS hacks by Major League Hacking. And uh, since uh, Jessica pointed out in the beginning that this um, hackathon had no theme, so we were kind of confused what to do. But then we all came together and decided that we wanted to do something for COVID. But since there was this air of mystery, you know, there had been a lot of projects done on COVID uh, by that point of time. We were just going through research papers and then we found out that there wasn't a single web app which could include the age, gender, as well as pre-existing conditions of a person and give them their uh, you know, vulnerability for COVID uh, as per those characteristics. And that is when we dug deeper into the research, into the reports that have been coming uh, you know, from all parts of the world. And we found out that this was something that needed to be addressed. And Wolfram, in fact, was the right language for it as it already had all these wonderful data sets that could be utilized. And that's how Trackoff came into being. Amazing. So maybe Claire, you could now go ahead and show off the project. <laughs> yeah, so this is our uh, project video. Uh, here we go. Coronavirus is a global crisis, and there's an enormous amount of data out there about locations, patient ages, genders, pre-existing conditions, and more. But it can be overwhelming to try and find reliable and personalized data in these uncertain times. I'm Claire. I'm Jessica. I'm Aranio. I'm Alicia. And we're the creators of Trackove, an interactive web tool that allows anyone to gain information about their coronavirus risk level based on information about their gender, age, and location. Trackove is a web-based tool that is user-friendly and easy to access. Just visit our website, www.trackove.tech. From there, you can learn more about the crisis and why we chose the characteristics that we did, or you can use our tool. When you open Trackove, you'll be prompted to enter your gender, age, and country. You can also select any pre-existing conditions that you want data about. Once you've submitted your information, the first output is your calculated coronavirus risk level. For the purposes of our web tool, risk is defined as the proportion of infected people who share one or more of the characteristics of the user out of the population of all people who share these characteristics. Risk is not the probability that the user will contract coronavirus. It's an informational number that we use to calculate the user's level of vulnerability based on his or her characteristics. Trackoff calculates risk level based on your gender, age, and country. First, a risk is calculated based solely on your location. This is done by calculating the most recent case count for your country from the Wolfram dataset and dividing this case count by the population of your country, also based on Wolfram data. The second component of risk level is based on age range and gender. The number of cases is retrieved from Wolfram data for people of your gender and in your age range in tens, from 0 through 10 all the way to 90 through 99. This number is divided by the number of people around the world in your age range and of your gender, which is collected from the United Nations. These two risk levels, risk due to country and risk due to age range and gender, are both multiplied by 100 for simplicity and are then summed to generate a final risk. We set threshold numbers to determine what should define low, moderate, high, and very high risk based on the risk outputs for many locations, genders, and ages. In addition to viewing your risk level, you can also explore a global map of cases within your age range and gender. Finally, you can view a graphical display of confirmed cases in your country, as well as the current death rate for cases in your age range and gender. 
If you selected any pre-existing conditions, you can receive information about how many infected people share those conditions. Traco uses credible sources to inform curious individuals about their risk for coronavirus. In the midst of a global pandemic, Traco helps us focus on spreading awareness and reliable data. Thank you. So that, that is the video that we created um, for the hackathon. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit more uh, around the website. So uh, here you can see this is just our homepage. We've got the video up here, some information about why we chose to create track of, and then I'm just gonna go up here to the about. Um, so on this page of the website, uh, you can see we emphasize uh, that we use the Wolfram language pretty heavily because it was the main sort of backbone of this project. Um, and then our main goals with creating track of were to make something that people can use very easily and that uses reliable data and that formats that data in a way that people are informed about relevant information. So the, like we calculate things based on characteristics that people share with the user. Um, so the research you can, the research that went into this, uh, this hackathon is a bit more on the resources page. So you can learn about why we chose to look at age and gender and country, uh, and then why we chose to give the user data about pre-existing medical conditions. Um, so we also have got uh, like an FAQ page. And the main thing to emphasize about track of is that risk is not the probability that you'll contract coronavirus. Uh, we thought that that would be a Sort of misunderstanding that people who use the tool might have so we've got things here about um, what to do with the different risk levels and what risk really means um, so that is our website okay so now i'm going to talk about um the code that went behind this all right So uh, first we wanted to have a numeric calculation of gender age risk level. So um, we kind of played around with this idea a bunch and um, we wanted to use the global demographic rather than just like uh, that of like the US or something because we discovered that the data set is actually not that large and it definitely is not all the cases that were reported reported like age and gender in the data set. And we discovered actually all of the cases of like coronavirus that actually had age and gender were in Florida. And obviously that was not very reliable, <laughs> but uh, by encompassing the entire world, we decided that that ratio would probably be the more, most accurate. So um, first we wanted to find um, the uh, number of people to total in the world that is in your age or age and gender demographic. So for instance, if you are 32 and you're a female, we would find people that are in the ages between 30 and 39 and are female and the total population of that. And we use data from the UN. So that's what this uh, first part is with um, find interval and find demo and then uh, find data too is the function that we um, go into the patient medical data that uh, is in the Wolfram data repository. And we're gonna select all of the cases that have the same age range and gender. And then um, after that, we took uh, the number of people with coronavirus in that age and gender group and divided it by the total population in that age gender group. And um, that gave us a very, very small number for the most part. So we multiplied by a hundred just so we can get like a decimal that has like a ten tenths place. So for instance, with this uh, calc risk function, um, we can put in female 72 and um, the risk level would be 0 0.3 three, two, while as um, a female that is 24 has a much lower risk because they are um, 
a lot younger and we already know that if you're older you're more at risk so uh, we decided that this was pretty accurate um, and then next we wanted to calculate the country risk level so again um, we thought maybe like going down to like the state level it would kind of be less accurate so we decided just to go by each country um, so initially we just used the total number of cases in the country, but um, we later discovered that um, this would not be very accurate for countries like China because um, China has already recovered from the pandemic basically. So they aren't, they're gonna have a lot of cases, but the cases aren't increasing. So we shouldn't put those people in like a high risk group. So um, we changed it to um, the change in cases in the past five days. So the number of cases that increased um, since five days ago. So um, this first uh, function is gonna pull uh, all the cases in that country. And then uh, we also want to include a plot of all the cases for each country. So we had the dateless plot for the time series. So uh, for instance, this is a plot of uh, Russia's confirmed cases um, from the very beginning. And then um, this next function is gonna uh, find the increase in cases in the past five days. And then we found the ratio of case increase to the country's population. So uh, we kind of, um, Determine this is basically the rate of infection. So we, we use this as the country risk. Um, and that also gives you a very, very small number. So we multiplied by 1000. But I think there's still some problems with this. And I posted this in the Wolfram community. Someone brought up that they probably shouldn't be this risk level um, since they're a young male and they're high risk, but really uh, the risk level in the United States is just so significantly higher than anywhere else that it kind of throws the imbalance off. So um, maybe we still need to play around with the numbers a little bit. Um, so as you can see, the country risk level in China is very, very t small. I'm guessing they only had like about three or four cases increase in the past five days, whereas in the US, the number is very large. Um, and then we wanted to add these two risk levels together. So we uh, have the calc total risk where we basically just add the two risk levels together. And we thought this would be pretty, pretty accurate since both of them are decimals to like the tenths place. And um, uh, we also wanted a plot with all the cases in that um, gender age um, range and um, we also wanted to include some data about the death rate. So we just found um, how many cases were reported as the patient died out of all the total cases in that gender age group. And then um, lastly, we wanted a very simple way to have like more of a verbal communication of your risk level. So we decided on this scale that labels you as low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or very high risk. So um, as you can see, um, this uh, female in the United States that is 85 years old is going to be at very high risk for COVID, which definitely makes sense. Um, and then uh, lastly, we wanted to include something about chronic conditions since uh, the Wolfram da data set also had that as part of it, but um, we decided like not to include it, it like within the risk level because we didn't exactly know how to quantify how much a chronic condition is gonna increase your risk level. So um, we decided just to include like how many cases have been reported with this chronic condition. Of course, this is not gonna be like a perfect number since not all of them were reported either, but um, basically this is what uh, finds all of the different uh, chronic conditions that were reported. And then um, this is gonna be a list of all the diseases 
just for our user interface. And then this is what finds the number of cases of reported chronic conditions. And um, the very last thing is, of course, putting everything together in the summary function. So um, as you can see, this is all the different pieces that we collected and we want to include in our site. So for instance, a female that is 72, uh, and you can check off hypertension and hip replacement. So her risk level is gonna be very high. Um, so this is the total risk, which is 0 0.621, and then risk due to your country and then risk due to your age range and gender. And then a map of all the cases, and then plot of confirmed cases in your country. <laughs> and lastly, the death rate and the number of cases of each chronic condition reported globally. And so basically we put this into a form page and we cloud deployed it. Um, at this point we would do a demo, but for some reason we discovered this morning that the Wolfram cloud site isn't really working. I swear it was working before because I like used it like last week and it was working perfectly, but I'm not quite sure <laughs> um, what happened with that. But yeah, that was our track cove project. Okay, Th thank you, Jessica, so much for going over the quote and Claire and Arne for introducing the project and going through the website. So I think now we could move to our second project, which is called Tail, which was developed as a part of Hack Now. So it's an application that is that facilitates like more in-depth uh, and multi-scale um, statistics for coronavirus in whichever level you want. So whether you want na national data or if you want state data or if you want county data, and you can access this information uh -huh. through Alexa or a Google Voice device. So that is what Cocktail was. So maybe I think oh Jessica is going to do the video and the code. So that was close together, but yeah. The Johns Hopkins CSS, the World Health Organization, the New York Times, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. With all of these sources of coronavirus data, it can be difficult to quickly find useful information about cases in the Seekers area. I'm Claire. I'm Jessica. I'm Aranyo. I'm Invasia. And we are Covetel, a voice app that links with your Amazon or Google device to give you up-to-date and relevant information on coronavirus. To use Covetel, simply choose whether you would like more information about your county, state, or the United States. Then input your location, and Covetel will use an application program interface, or API, coded in Wolfram to return information. Here's an example of Covetel's response for a user seeking information about Los Angeles County, California. For state and national data, Covetel will use different APIs also coded in Wolfram to calculate and return the change in the rate of infection to describe whether the national and state curves are flattening or not. Here's an example of a user who wants information about Virginia. And here's an example of a user who wants information about the United States. We hope that people across the nation will use Covetel as a quick and easy way to access reliable data about coronavirus near them and the infection rates around them. By raising awareness about the spread of coronavirus and making sure that more people have easily accessible coronavirus data, we are doing our part to flatten the curve. Thank you. All right. So um, yeah, that demo was kind of sad because none of us had an actual Alexa. So we had to just type in the commands, but um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so now I'm going to just go over like all our code. We didn't really have like a pretty user interface for this one since it is like a voice app. 
Um, I think this was probably one of our like most challenging projects to make just because we had no idea how to deal with like APIs. We had no idea what JSON meant and it was all really confusing. And especially since we had to use two different like, um, not like languages, but we also had to use voice flow to create our voice app. And it was really hard to like incorporate like the Wolfram into the voice flow. And yeah, we definitely almost gave up like 10 hours in and cause we just couldn't figure it out, but it all worked out in the end. Um, I don't think it's working today very well, but um, I think it might be something wrong with like the data set because like since our two COVID projects aren't working and like the non-COVID project is working, I don't know. But um, so uh, we, we basically started out with wanting to go with like the county level and we kind of expanded it to also incorporate like state and national data. So we basically just wanted a convenient way for people to get very fast information about their local area and COVID through just talking to their Alexa. So um, first we have um, the county level and we um, use the interpreter to find which US county that they're talking about. And um, we also required the user to say their state since there's a bunch of like repeat counties and then uh, this next function just finds the data that we wanted to use, a same data set, epidemic data for novel coronavirus. And then um, this next line just finds uh, the most recent values of confirmed cases and deaths. And so uh, we just wanted it from the last day to the day before the last day, because we want the one day increase. And then since we do want the Alexa to say it, we uh, formatted it into a readable string um, in this uh, line of code. So using like string join, we just linked all the parts together. So for instance, if we are looking up Suffolk County, New York, uh, it will return this phrase in Suffolk County, New York, United States from Thursday. May 14th to Friday, May 15th, confirmed cases increased from 37,544 to 37,719. And we also included the deaths and the increase in deaths. Um, and lastly, we use the API function to uh, uh, carry out all these functions. And we made, made sure to uh, format into JSON, which is one of the problems that we discovered to connect it to VoiceFlow. And yeah, so the VoiceFlow app directly will access this API and um, get this string to read out to the user. And then next, uh, we uh, expanded it to state level. So it's the same format where we looked up the confirmed case increase and the deaths and um, all the same thing <laughs> and national same thing too um, and this is good because um, you, you can figure out more stuff that isn't in the U.S. because obviously county and state data was only available for the U.S. and you can also get that daily update in the increase in cases. And then lastly, we decided to do something a little fancier. <laughs> um, Claire, do you want to talk about it a little bit since you were the one who figured this whole thing out? Yeah, sure. So uh, we hear a lot about like flattening the curve and things like that um, and how that's a good thing. We really want to be flattening the curve, uh, but not a lot of people really know what it means. So uh, what we decided to do here is calculate uh, the alpha value. And so uh, if that, if the value is low, less than one, the, or I, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, it's been a while since we did this. Uh, but we calculated the alpha value, which tells you like whether the curve is flattening or not. So we used, we used the data to calculate the alpha value. And then that uh, voice flow will tell you like, this is the alpha value for your state or for the United States. And uh, the curve is flattening or the curve is not flattening. And Jessica is opening up the article that we used uh, to calculate the alpha value. So this will show you the equation uh, that we 
put in here to calculate. So yeah, if you just scroll down, it's it's down there. Is it this? No, it's flattening the curve. It's, so yeah. like they show like, so those are, scroll down a little bit more. We'll show you like the whole, so that's like the rate. So those two curves right there, you can see that blue curve is curve that is like not flattened. And then the red curve is like a flatter curve. So our curve is changing, right? So we're trying to see whether or not we are flattening the curve. Yeah, um, so I think the blue curve, the alpha value was 0 0.394 and then the red one is 0 0.3. So basically if that, change is negative that means the curve is flattening is what i um understand yeah that's what i'm sorry it's been it's been a long time uh but yeah so we calculated we calculated the alpha value for the two most recent like changes in date that wolfram had in its data set and then if that alpha value was decreasing then it's flattening if it was increasing it was not flattening my apologies uh, but yeah so that is the wolfram code um I'm gonna talk a little bit about the voice flow code. And as Jessica said, the most difficult part of this project was definitely um, coordinating the two. So I'm gonna share um, voice flow here. Um, so this right here is the like voice flow user interface. So voice flow is this app this uh, sort of platform that makes it really easy to create voice apps for Alexa or Google. So what you do is you just insert like little blocks and then you can make arrows to tell Alexa or Google like what to do next, depending on the user input. So the way that we uh, created CoveTel was first, it will ask you what sort of data you'd like to hear about. So county, state or nation, and then the user can tell what sort of data they want to hear about. So for example, if they wanted to hear about county data, uh, we'll ask you what your state is and then capture what you say. So like take that in and then it will take in your county. And then what it does is it sends a get request to our county data API, which we made in Wolfram. So you can see right here, it's getting uh, something from Wolfram Cloud, which is that API and then uh, it will take the output. So it, it gets it and it will input right here. You can see the county equals the county input that you said previously in the state is your state input. And then it will get this output result, which Jessica showed um, as it, it compiling. And then it will just tell you that whole output result, which was like in X county from this date to that date, number of cases has increased or stayed the same. Um, and then you can go back here and hear about another type of data. So if you wanted to hear about state data, you it will like capture your state again and then send a request to our state data API, which is pretty much the same thing. And it gives you that information about um, like, is the number of cases changing? Is it increasing or staying the same? Um, and then it will send a request to the state curve API and get that information about the alpha value for whether the curve is flattening or not. So you can see right here, uh, we have our API request and then the state is whatever the user said their state was, and then it will give you this result. Um, so we have Alexa or Google just say both of these results. And for na national, data, <laughs> national data, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so we were only able to get this to work for the US. Um, so it doesn't ask for an input of your nation because it assumes you're in the US. So it will give you this same information about cases in the US and then information about the national curve. Um, yeah, the getting voice flow to coordinate with Wolfram was, was very difficult, but we managed it in the end uh, with the APIs. Okay. Uh, okay, I think uh, we should move on. Uh, Jessica, you were saying something? Oh, nothing. I was just saying we can move on to the next project. <laughs> okay, so let us now move on to our last project, which was also the first one that we did as a team. So it's Green Up. And maybe Arna, you can take it from there. So I. 
So GreenUp was our first project that we did for Hack the Helix. And the topic was uh, environmental sustainability. So at first it was like really difficult to connect those two topics, but uh, we managed to do it and we used the whole from language for uh, the entire project. So this is our homepage. As you can see there, here is information about urban green space and why is it important. And you can test the tool here, which I'll show a few results in a bit. Here is a video. So uh, I'll play the video. Can you increase the volume on that? Yeah. Is it just the volume of your computer? I think, yeah, I think it might be your computer. Um, oh. okay, you guys can't hear it? No. Oh, um, okay. Aranya, can I try playing it on mine? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You just end the screen share. All right, technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm Jessica. I'm Aranio. I'm Invasia. And we are Green Up. Our business idea is a nonprofit organization that will raise public awareness about urban green space in cities around the world and in our audience's neighborhoods. By 2050, the United Nations estimates that over two-thirds of people around the world will live in cities. Urban green spaces are an important component for rapidly growing cities because they mitigate urban heat islands, increase biodiversity, and filter air and water pollution. To raise awareness about urban green space, we created an interactive web tool which allows users to view green space in their area and determine a green grade for their location and places around the world. By raising awareness about how much green space is in our user cities, GreenUp targets three of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 11, to create sustainable cities and communities. Goal 15, to use ecosystems sustainably. And Goal 9, to promote sustainable industrialization. We hope to gain funding from Spark Team to expand our business. Jessica will now talk about how GreenUp works. On our homepage, you can access our green space detector, created using the Wolfram language, a general multi-paradigm computational language. Details of our algorithms are listed in our webpage. Essentially, the user can input a location and a distance, which are used as the center and radius respectively when generating a satellite image. Then, all pixels that are close to the color of green are detected and changed into red, producing the second visual. The number of green pixels are counted to determine the total number of green pixels present. The ratio between green pixels and total pixels in the image is calculated, and that is used to find the area in square kilometers and a grade on a letter scale. Lastly, we created a visual that indicates distance from green pixels, where highlighted areas are furthest away from a green space. Now, Aranyo and Anwesha will discuss how our tool is impactful and our future plans. As our interact tool is accessible and user-friendly, citizens will be encouraged to test for their locations. This, in turn, will encourage them to advocate for green space in their communities if they find that availability in their region is low. Thus, by engaging the community on a whole, Green Up will take the first stride towards sustainable cities of the 21st century. As we went ahead with the code, we realized that we wanted to make it public-spirited so that everyone could use it. The World Health Organization recommends 9 square meters of green space for every person and half to 1 hectare of green space within 300 meters in urban settings. For this, we devised your location. Our code can determine green space around your coordinates. Just allow access, set a distance and get your results. Green Up could potentially be used by a wide range of people. From professionals, such as city planners looking to assess the quality of green space in an area, to someone searching for the nearest park. Right now, our code picks up even the smallest patches of green. In the future, we hope to refine our algorithm by also identifying polygons and larger green spaces and attempting to classify them as private or public green spaces. 
making our product more accessible and accurate. In addition to this, we hope to modify our letter grading system such that it is not solely dependent on the ratio of green area to total area, but also takes in factors like size, distance from the user, and the quality of green space into account. If granted funding by Spark Team, we intend to expand GreenUp's data storage capacity to serve more city dwellers, launch letter writing campaigns so that interested citizens around the world can lobby the legislators for urban green space, and design an online course for high school students to learn about sustainability in urban areas. Thank you for your time. We hope you share our vision for the future of sustainable cities. Support GreenUp. Let's make space for green space. Yeah, we didn't get the funding from Spark Teen. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really uh, funny to go back to it like after a month and a half or something and like look at it. Uh, but sure. <laughs> um, Arno, maybe do you want to take it from here and like do a walkthrough for the website? Yeah, sure. So, okay. So. This is the homepage and we already went through the you know motivation behind why we chose urban green space for uh, environmental sustainability and this was a rating scale that we used uh, which you guys will hear about when we discuss the code and we also had a how it works page so for each of our websites we uh, typically had a how it works because we wanted people who are viewing the website to know the logic behind how we used wolfram and the different uh, components of Fulfram, which were used in making our uh, projects. And this, uh, uh, we followed a FAQ style uh, walkthrough to our code, which you can see on our website. We also have a sign section, so where we explain the signs behind urban green spaces and how much urban green space is uh, required in a community for the betterment of its citizens. And we also link the resources that we used for this. Our rating scales and our um, the working of our app was actually based off all of these peer-reviewed papers that we linked here. We also have a sustainability page where we link the various UN SDGs and how these connect to urban green space availability in a community. And we also have a team page. And since this um, is something that you can use, go to our home page. You know. Um, enter your location and find the green space availability in our community. Uh, I, I already uh, uh, did one for Abu Dhabi. So Abu Dhabi, uh, I put a distance of five. And as you can see, the results show uh, that it got a score of D, which is the second lowest score. And that um, here is a distance from the green space on the Abu Dhabi map. And as you can see, our code is really accurate. It does not pick up most of the C or the blue area. It only picks up the green areas in the city, although there are some areas where there are certainly we could improve upon. But this, uh, in fact, was a very powerful code as we did. You can literally view cities from across the world and you know find a green space, a, a green score for each city. I also did one for New York. so. If you put in New York and put a distance of two, you can see that New York also gets a score of D as it is a metropolitan city. And it, the R code accurately picks up all the green spaces that the city of New York has. And I also, there's, yeah, this is Bangalore, which is another metropolitan city in India. And it gets a score of F. So the green uh, space area in Bangalore is critically low. And that is something that citizens in Bangalore can use this app to find out you know uh, just know more about the city and what possible ways there are to improve this green space okay so claire i think you're going to take it from there for the code yep so here is all the code um that we use to create green up. So just starting from the top here, sorry, my computer's a little bit slow. Okay, so the first thing that's here is obviously we want the user to be able to input a city 
and a radius and kilometers that they want to be looking at. So the first thing that we do is create a map uh, based on that. So we use the like geo image, geo range. And <clears throat> so we, we create a map at the place that the user wants with the radius and kilometers that they've selected. Um, so here's an example. There's sort of like a running example through this code of Chicago. So here's an example of just getting that map from Wolfram, um, the satellite image for Chicago with a radius of 2.5. So after we did this, we realized it's kind of hard to see like where our code is identifying green areas. So we, oh man, we, we identified uh, green areas using this color replace. So this gets all green areas in a map with sort of a margin of error of 0.26, which we found was the best to not pick up areas of water like this, but to pick up most uh, green spaces. So this transforms all of the green pixels to red pixels. And you saw that in when Aranya was demonstrating the tool, uh, how you'd see this map with all the red dots. So all of the green spaces here are turned to red. And you can see that this is pretty accurate. Like right here, we've got this baseball field and that's identified as a green space. So the next thing we did was just calculate how many uh, green pixels or red pixels we had identified. Uh, and that's just this G pixel calc. So you can see there's 55,815 red pixels in this map of Chicago. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do was calculate a ratio of green space to total space in the image that the user picked. So that's this uh, pixel ratio command. So you can input the number of green pixels and then the map, and then it gets uh, the ratio of green to total. Uh, space. And then we could actually calculate that area in kilometers by just multiplying by the uh, area of the whole map. So that's, you know, well and good. We can look at Chicago and say, oh, they've got 2.82748 square kilometers of green space. But we wanted to make it a bit more user friendly by actually giving grades to communities. So what we did is we had grades uh, A, B, C, D, and F. And we uh, from the ratio of the number of green pixels to total pixels, we uh, got each ratio to identify a grade. So if your ratio is 0 to 0.05 of green to total space, you get an F. Whereas if your ratio is 0.2 to 1, you get an A. Um, and then the last thing that we did, which you saw at the bottom of those demonstrations, is this map here. So uh, we used we used Wolfram and this like distance transform function to get a map that shows you, so in white are areas that are far from green space and black or like darker are areas that are really close to green space or that are green space. So the goal with this is to show like city planners which areas of their cities might need more green space. So like right here near this huge green space, uh, obviously there's no white in here because it's all green space. Whereas like here in this more sort of industrial section, uh, or even here in this like residential section, you can see that there aren't a lot of public green spaces available. Um, and then the last thing that we did was make this into a form that users could access from our website. Uh, and that's just done with cloud deploy to create a form. Okay, so I think with that, we're at the end of demonstrating slash showing off all of our projects that we did as a part of various hackathons. So I think I'll be doing the end note of thanks. So thank you for the hackathon team for being here. So thanks, Claire, Jessica, and Arundo. Uh, thank you, Wolfram, for making this happen. And yeah, thank you to our viewers who may be doing this right now or later. Um, I'm pretty sure all of our code and um, our projects are going to be available somewhere. Uh, they're also available in the Wolfram community. So be sure to check them out if you have any queries. And you can also reach out to us through them or through our website. Um, thank you.